One doorway that leads to life One redemption, one confession I believe in the name of Jesus Christ I believe in the crucifixion By His blood I have been set free I believe in the resurrection Hallelujah, his life is death's defeat. All praise to God the Father. All praise to Christ the Son. All praise to the Holy Spirit. Our God has overcome the King who was and is and evermore will be in Jesus my Preparing a place for me Far beyond what hearts imagine Ears have heard or eyes have seen I believe that a day is coming He's returning to claim his bride Light the altar, keep it burning Encounter Church.
Good morning, church. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Emma, and I'm the youth pastor here at Encounter. It's so good to be with you all this morning. Um, we just want to say welcome, and thank you for joining us. If it's your first time here, we want to say a special welcome to you. Um, we're so glad that you came to worship this morning. Uh, if it is your first time, if you go out these back doors at the end of service, and to the right, we have a welcome team, and they would love to say hi, um, get to know you a little bit, and we also have something there called a Connect card that you could fill out if you would like, um, and that just gives you the opportunity to share any contact information with us if you choose to do so, so that we can stay connected with you and keep you up to date on everything happening at church. Uh, we have a small gift for you there as well. If you're joining us online, we'd love for you to send an email to the office um, so we connect, can connect with you as well. Uh, this morning we have a few announcements, a few reminders of events coming up. So this weekend there are two events, one for men's ministry and one for women's. Um, the men's ministry is having a worship night on Saturday. The information's on the screen there. Um, you don't have to RSVP, you can just show up. Maybe bring a lawn chair because it will be outside. In case of rain, it'll be inside. But if it's outside, you'll maybe want a chair, so I'd encourage you to bring that. Um, and that's for all ages of men. Uh, the, the women's ministry is having an event on Friday. Um, again, info on the screen, coffee and conversations. This one you should RSVP for, and you can do that in the lobby or emailing the church office. Um, we also want to uh, tell everybody about our upcoming church yard sale, and that's September 7th. There is a bunch of info in the lobby, so stop by there if you'd like to host a table or if you have some stuff you want to get rid of and you want to donate it. All the proceeds will go to the men's ministry, the women's ministry, and marriage and family ministry. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, um, we have a ministry here called One-to-One -one Care, and this is for um, se caring for seniors, and this ministry is really starting to take off, so we need some more people, some more volunteers. Um, and so what this ministry does is um, they spend time with the elderly shut-ins, and so if that's something that maybe you think you have a heart for, um, stop by the lobby and there's information about how to get involved. Um, we'd love for you to join that ministry. Um, this morning, if you would stand with me, I'm going to say a word of prayer before we um, just join in worship together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house this morning, for the opportunity to praise your name, um, to rejoice, and um, just give you praise and gratitude for all of your blessings upon our life, Lord. Um, God, we come before you today in humility. We lay down ourselves, Lord, and um, allow us to just set aside every distraction this morning so that we can um, enter your holy place here to worship you. Lord, thank you again for, for this opportunity, Lord. Thank you for a church family that loves you, and um, I pray that you would just strengthen the church family even more, that we would learn to rely on each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, Lord. Um, help us to be vulnerable with our brothers and sisters, Lord. Thank you for Jesus, who has paid the price for all of our sins, Lord, um, a gift that we do not deserve. We thank you for that, Lord. Bless our time this morning in worship, our time of teaching, Lord, be with Ted. Thank you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Good morning, church family. It is so good to be worshiping with you all this morning. Before we start out our um, time of worship, we are actually going to um, do something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, and I know a lot of you have maybe had experiences with um, liturgies, but what we're going to do is basically come together as a body and we're going to proclaim things about the God that we serve. And so um, I will read some statements and then you will respond back with either we praise you, we worship you, we thank you for who you are. Um, so this morning I pray that as we enter worship that we would take these things to heart that it's not about us, but it's the, about the God that we serve and that we worship. O oh God and Father of all, we lift to you here our hearts and prayers. For grace and provision in the coming week, we, we look, look to you. you. For life-giving gifts of your word and your truth, we, we are thankful. thankful. For the joys of life shared with family and friends, we, we praise, praise you. you. For the grace to live in grateful humility, we, we look, look to you. you. For the many small blessings and beauties that surround us, we, we are thankful. thankful. For the displays of your majesty and power in our world, we, we praise, praise you. you. 
for the promise of your constant presence, giving hope and comfort and strength and joy in the various moments and labors of the week to come. We bless, bless your holy name. name. May the rhythms of our petitions and thanksgivings become in time like the steady drumbeat in a long and unending song of your faithfulness, O oh God. Sing the song forever. 
little bit since I got to worship with you guys, and uh, I'm loving it. This is a this is a song uh, that I've heard as a favorite, uh, and it's one of my favorites that I've ever sung. Uh, it's called "Death Was Arrested," and if you're not familiar with it, uh, I would encourage you to really listen to the words of these songs or this song because uh, it just tells the story of my life, uh, my inevitable death, and a God who saved me. From, from just a, a crazy, crazy life and situation that I got myself into. Um, this, this is one of my favorites. Let's sing it out together. I know you guys know it. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in Yes it did When death was arrested was redeemed, only beauty remains, and my orphan heart was given a name, my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance, when death was arrested. Your grace so free washes over me. You have made me new now. Life begins with you. Oh, it's your My chains, I'm a prisoner no more. Amen. My shame was a ransom me. He canceled my debt and he called me his friend. When death was arrested in my life, he Savior displayed on that criminal's cross. That wasn't the end. No darkness rejoices of heaven at cross. Oh, but then Jesus arose with our freedom in his hand. Yes, That's when death was arrested in my life.
you so much for changing lives. Thank you for the worship. Thank you for the words. God, thank you for this morning and the freedom that we have to meet together and praise you. God, we love you so much. Uh, just bless our time together. Amen. Y'all can take a seat. 1 John chapter 5, verses 1 through 21. This is what John says. He's, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has become a child of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his children too. And we know we love God's children if we love God and obey his commandments. Loving God means keeping his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. For every child of God defeats this evil world and we achieve this victory through faith. And who can win this battle against the world? Only those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus Christ was revealed as God's Son by his baptism in water and by shedding his blood on the cross. So we have these three witnesses, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and all three agree. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have God's Son does not have life. I have written this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. It says, we know we love God by obeying his commandments, which include loving his children. And if we love his children, we're obeying his commandments, which show that we love God. And of course, John heard this directly from Jesus. He, goes on, he says, those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my father will love them and I will love them and I will reveal myself to each one of them. God's commandments are not pleasing. They are wonderful. You see, his commandments, they have been a protection to my life, a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. Think of God's commands like guardrails when you are driving down a particularly dangerous road. The world, they're in opposition to that. For every child of God defeats this evil world. And how do we achieve this victory? We achieve it through our faith. We will not have victory over this world by our strength or our intelligence or our income or by our status or by our family or by our drive. We have victory only because of our faith in him and his promises. And St. John says we have three witnesses. We have the spirit, we have the water, and we have the blood. And all three of these witnesses agree. Jesus is Christ. Jesus said this, that I will send you the advocate spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and he will testify all about me. I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and so I testify. He is the chosen one of God. He himself bore our sins in his body on that tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. All of this points to him. He is the Christ. And good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is a wonderful morning to be with y'all here this morning. Uh, my name is Ted. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Encounter Church. And welcome to week nine. It's hard to believe that we've been in this for nine weeks. But welcome to week nine of the series that we have just titled The Letters of John. We have just been working through the epistles of John chapter by chapter. Last week, we finished uh, 1 John. And this week, we are going to work through the entire book of 2 John. And that sounds really impressive until you realize it only has 13 verses in it. But we're going to work through the entire book here this morning. Uh, and, and so if you brought your Bibles with you, go ahead and pull them out a while. We're going to be in the New Testament book of 2 John, verses 1 through 13. If you want to turn your phones on, that's fine. The words will be on the screen as well. Uh, but while you're turning there, I want to begin this morning with a question. I have a question for all y'all to kind of think about and ponder here this morning. Here's your question. As a pastor here at Encounter Church, what do you think my primary focus should be? It's a good question. I spent a lot of time this week thinking about this question, and what makes it such a challenging question is because there's so many good answers. 
How do you narrow it down to just one thing that would be the primary focus? Well, I want to tell you a story, uh, a personal story. This is kind of a see how well you know your pastor kind of story here. All right, here's my question. I've talked about this before, and so if you know the answer, if you think you know the answer, feel free to just shout it out. I'd be real curious, actually, to hear what your, what your answers are. Growing up, what do you think my number one fear was? I heard snakes. I heard spiders. Something that's not animal related. I'll give you that hint. Water. I hear girls. Did someone say girls? That might be it. No. My number one fear was public speaking. I'm not making that up. Friends, i got to be honest with you, even today, every single time I get up here on this stage, you have to understand that I am nervous. This is not something that I wanted to do. That's part of the reason why I went into nursing, because I didn't have to do any type of public presentations. One-on-one conversation, no problem. Getting up in front of people, no thank you. That wasn't what I wanted to do. God definitely has a sense of humor. But... After working for a few years as a nurse, it became overtly obvious that that was not what the Lord had for me to do with the rest of my life. Now, that's good. That's fine to know that. But the problem was I had no idea what I was supposed to do with my life. And my wife and I, we had just gotten married. We were living in Virginia, and we were there for an entire year. And friends, over that entire year... I was struggling with this. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. That was a really hard place to be in for that entire year. We were newlyweds, and I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. I knew what it wasn't supposed to be, but I didn't know what it was supposed to be. And I went through the gamut of ideas. I'll tell you what, I had a conversation with Heather, it seems like, every other day. Here's an interesting insight into some of the things that I thought about pursuing as a career. I legitimately thought about going back to school and becoming an engineer. I thought about going back to school to become a veterinarian. I thought about going back to school to become a chiropractor. I even took active steps in pursuing my licensure as a real estate agent. And I also thought about opening my very own Froyo store. Okay. (laughs) If you don't believe me, go ask Heather. She will confirm that. But I spent an entire year in this place, and and I didn't know what it was. But at the end of that year, the Lord literally dropped ministry into my lap. Now, friends, I got to tell you, out of all the careers that I thought about pursuing, ministry was not one of them. But the opportunity was so obvious, and I had been so deliberate and consistent in prayer that I knew this is what the Lord had for me to do. But there were some issues with it. I had zero experience, zero. And when I say zero, you know, I, I had been a believer my entire life, but at that point in my life, I'm not even sure I had ever even led a devotional. When I say zero, I mean zero. B, this role would require me to face my biggest fear head on. I knew that I was going to have to speak publicly on a regular basis. I knew that. It was terrifying. See, we were living in Virginia at the time, which means I had to face up my second greatest fear, which was moving to New Jersey. (laughs) Just kidding. All right, that was probably like my third or fourth greatest fear. No, in all seriously, we didn't have an apartment lined up in New Jersey, and this role was starting quickly. My wife, she didn't have a job lined up in New Jersey, and to say that my salary was going to be livable would be, well, uh, an understatement. It was not anything even remotely close to what I was making as a nurse. Friends, there was all kinds of issues associated with this opportunity. Spoiler alert, I did enter into ministry. All right, I'm just, but I'm thankful I did. Now, here's why I tell you this story, and here's why it relates to the question that we asked at the beginning. I had complete faith that the Lord had called me into this. I knew it. But I had to ask myself this question. Would I act on it? 
You see, James, James uh, says it this way in the book of James, in, in chapter 2, verses 14, and then 19 through 20, this is what James says about this. He says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but then you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? You say that you have faith, for you believe that there is one God. Good. Good for you. Even the demons believe this, and they tremble in terror. How foolish. Can't you see that faith without good deeds is useless? Friends, good, to go back to the question that I asked, when, when it comes to being a pastor, when it comes to being your pastor, yes, of course I want you all to place your faith in Jesus Christ. Of course I want you to grow in your knowledge and understanding of what Scripture teaches. But even more than that, I want us to put all of these things together so that we can be transformed, that our lives would be transformed, that we would combine our faith and our actions together. You, you see, friends, the, 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 my goal isn't, after a Sunday morning, to have people come up to me and say, oh, Pastor Ted, that sermon was the greatest sermon that I ever heard in my entire life. I, I learned so much from it. Don't get me wrong. I mean, if that's true, I love to hear that. that that's helpful. It's encouraging. That's not the goal. Friends, the goal is when people come up to me and say, Pastor Ted, i got to tell you something that the Lord has been doing in my life. How he has been transforming me. How he used me to reach my coworker or my neighbor or my friend. And now they, they're on this journey with faith. And I'm like, oh my word, that kind, of, that kind of feedback is so encouraging. The combination of knowing what the Lord is calling us to do and then stepping out and actually doing that. Faith, action, together. That is what... I want for this church. And, and the beautiful thing is, this is exactly what John talks about. In the book of 2 John, this is what he talks about. So the question is, well, what does he say? What is it that he says? And friends, that is why we're going to study it here this morning. And so if you're going to follow along with me, here we go. We're going to start in verse 1 and we're going to go through verse 13. This is what it says. It says, this letter is from John, the elder. And I'm writing to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth, as does everyone else who knows the truth, because the truth lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace, which come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, will continue to be with us who live in truth and love. John says, how happy I was to meet some of your children and to find them living according to the truth just as the Father commanded. I'm writing to remind you, dear friends, that we should love one another. This isn't a new commandment. This is one that we've had from the beginning. Love means doing what God has commanded us, and he has commanded us to love one another, just as you've heard from the beginning. John says, I, I say this because many deceivers have gone out into the world. They deny that Jesus Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and an antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you receive your full reward. Anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God. But anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ... Don't invite that person into your home. Don't give any kind of encouragement. Anyone who encourages such people become partners in their evil work. I have much more to say to you, but I don't want to do it with paper and ink, for I hope to visit you soon and talk with you face to face. Then all of our joy will be complete. Greetings from the children of your sister, chosen by God. And that's it. That's the entire book of 2 John, which is all the further we're going to go in our reading today, because now we need to apply it. We need to ask our most important question. It's the same question Pastor Lon Solomon used to ask every single week, and it's such an important question. And so please, on the count of three, shout this question out loud. Here we go. One, two, three. So what? Yeah. Ted, you say, so what? What is it that John is telling us in this second book of John? What does this have to do with life transformation? What does this have to do with putting our faith into action? And friends, it's such a good question, and let's just jump right in. 
The beginning of this book is no different than many of the other New Testament letters. It begins with an introduction, a very beautiful one. And this is how John starts. He simply says, this letter is from John, the elder. Now, I need to explain something here about Bible translations. We get a lot of questions about Bible translations. Ted, why are there so many translations? What do all the translations mean? What translation should I read? Those are wonderful questions. I'll, sometime, I will. I'll, I'll do a, a whole talk on Bible translations just to clarify. But I want to just clarify something specifically here. Because we are reading what we call the New Living Translation, the NLT for short. And I love this translation. I love it because it's such an accessible translation. I can read it and I can understand for the most part what it's trying to say. Some translations I read it and I'm like, I, I have no clue what that was trying to tell me. The NLT is it's very accessible. However, it's also really helpful to know something about the New Living Translation. Every now and again, it'll do something like this. It starts by saying, this letter is from John, the elder. But if you have a translation, maybe like the English Standard Version or maybe the New International Version, your translation will just begin with the elder. That's all it begins with. It doesn't include the, this letter is from John part. And you might be thinking, well, why is that? Why does the New Living Translation include this letter is from John if that's not in the other translations? And the, and the answer to that is because the New Living tra Translation sometimes adds those sorts of things for clarity. It's almost like reading through a Bible commentary at part of it. And it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just a good thing to be aware of when you're reading through this translation. And this is why I encourage people, read multiple translations, especially if you're trying to study a verse, because they'll say it slightly different, and it helps to be able to understand exactly what's going on. But they will occasionally add information like this because scholars, the majority of scholars agree, John wrote this letter. And so the New Living Translation adds that just for clarity. But I, I hope that's just clarifying. I just wanted to share that with you because sometimes something as simple as that trips people up. When they're reading scripture, they're like, ah, can I believe anything that's in here? <laughs> yes, yes, you can. That's honestly a beautiful thing that we have so many translations because they can sharpen one another. Okay, I just wanted to briefly talk about this. Okay, continuing on, John says, I'm writing to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth as does everyone else who knows the truth, because the truth lives in us and will be with us forever. Now, at first glance, this is a little confusing because it appears that John is writing this letter to this very special lady, this special lady and her children. And, and some people have concluded that that's what John is doing, but that would be a pretty small amount of people that have concluded in that. Instead, the vast majority of scholars understand that John is writing to figuratively here. He's writing illustratively here. So he's not writing to a specific lady. Rather, he's writing to a sister church and the members of that congregation. And you might think, well, that's kind of a strange way of saying it. Why didn't he just say what he means? And the answer is, well, he did say what he means. Because this is a very common way of talking about other churches. For example, if you've ever been a part of a, of, of, of a church that's very close with another church, you have a great relationship with them, they're probably part of the same denomination, what do you refer to that church as? You refer to them as your sister church. It's just a very common way of referring to it. And that could honestly be a reference back to Ephesians. When, when it, the, the, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. It's, just, it's beautiful language that John is using here. So he did say what he means. It's not an uncommon way of talking. But it just, we need some, some context and some clarity. John continues, I love you in truth. As does everyone who knows the truth. Because the truth lives in us. And it will be with us forever. Now, what does John mean? When he says, I love you in truth. Well, in John 14, 6, Jesus refers to himself as the truth. Not that he just speaks truth. He embodies it. He is truth. And basically what John is saying here is, I love you in Christ. As well as everyone else who is in Christ because Christ unifies us together as brothers and sisters. And y'all have probably experienced this before. It's one of those things where you say, wow, this world is such a small world. For example, imagine you go on a trip somewhere. Maybe you've even gone to another country. And while you're in that country, you randomly run into someone, and you get talking, and you find out that that person grew up in the same town that you did. 
or, or they went to the same college that you went to, or that you know someone that they know, or you find out that they're an Eagles fan, you know? <laughs> These sort of things, they, they draw us together, anyway. But it, it forms a bond, right? With complete strangers, all of a sudden you're like, wow, I, I, I feel this connection with you. Well, this is kind of what John is talking about here, except he's talking about it with belief in Christ, which is just on a whole entire different level. He says, I love you because of Christ, in Christ. And then John continues in verse 3. He says, grace, mercy, and peace. And these come from the God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. And they will continue to be with us who live in truth and love. And friends, listen, I, I'm tempted to do this, and I'm confident many of you do it as well. We read verses like this, and we just skip over them. We read this kind of thing all the time in Scripture, and we're like, yeah, 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 yeah. Stop for a moment. When you read this and reflect on what these three promises truly are, grace, mercy, and peace, they are specific blessings that we have been given from the Lord. Friends, mercy means that we do not get what we deserve. Amen. Praise God for that. Grace means that we get the things we do not deserve. When you put those together, we don't suffer death because of our sins. That is mercy. But not only that, we also are adopted as children of God. We are heirs of his kingdom. Just stop and think about that. We have been given both mercy and grace. And John also says, and peace. And peace, this is just an idea that conveys safety and rest and wholeness. Friends, all these things come from God. If you read that in scripture, don't skip over it. Just pause, reflect over that. Thank the Lord. Wow, thank you. Thank you for what you have done for me. It's a wonderful blessing. And that concludes the introduction to this letter. And then John jumps straight into a section about life transformation. This is what he talks about in verse 4. He says, How happy I was to meet some of your children and find them living according to the truth, just as the Father commanded. And here it is. You see, John ran into some of the members of this church and he found that they weren't just hearers of the church. They couldn't just articulate the truths about Jesus, but they were living out his commands. And John just says, my joy, how happy I was to find them actively living out their faith. You see, friends, faith in Christ must result in practical application. This is what John reminds us of in the next few verses. He says in verse five, he says, I am writing to you to remind you, dear friends, we should love one another. This isn't a new commandment. This is one that we've had from the very beginning. Love means doing what God has commanded us, and he has commanded us to love one another, just as you heard from the beginning. Now, I'm not going to get into this in length this morning because we've literally spent the last several weeks talking about love and loving one another. And yes, it is an important topic, but there's only so much you can say about it. And so I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but please remove from your mind any of like the, the, the common understandings of love, that love is just some kind of mushy type of feeling that you feel towards other people. No, that's not it, and that's not what John is talking about. He's talking about the self-sacrificial love that's inconvenient that's challenging, that's often messy, it means giving up of ourselves or the things that we have because of our great love for Christ. It drives us to love one another. We share what we have. We grieve with those who are grieving. We celebrate with those who are celebrating. And we do this because we love Christ. We lean into relationship. Friends, we were made for relationship. Don't forget that. This is what living out faith looks like. And John was so encouraged to find these brothers and sisters living out their faith, especially in light of what was going on in the context of that day. And he continues in verse 7. He says, I say this because many deceivers, not one, many, have gone out into the world. And these deceivers, they deny that Christ came in a real body. Such a person is a deceiver and they are an antichrist. Now, we, we key in on this term antichrist here. It kind of is one of those terms you hear it and you go, ooh, <laughs> that, that means something. Well, it does mean something. But it's interesting, John is the only New Testament author that uses this term. He's the only one. And he only uses it in the books of 1 John and in 2 John. Those are the only times that you'll find this term used in 
the New Testament. And so let me remind you again, we talked about this back in week three of the series, but I want to remind you just again what this term means, what John means when he talks about this term antichrist. He's not talking about the antichrist that we see in Revelation, the antichrist who is to come. No, he's talking about those who have already come, those who are here right now, talking to the church back then. But friends, I would also say talking to the church right now, right now. The goal of these deceivers that John has termed antichrist is to set themselves in the place of Christ. There is to set themselves in the place of Christ. And this is what they came claiming. They came claiming that they had the true and correct grasp on salvation. It wasn't faith in Jesus that mattered. What mattered was more knowledge. If you just understood more, then you would be saved. Guess who had that knowledge? They did. They came to teach a different gospel. Paul warns us very, 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 very specifically about believing in any gospel that is different than the one that we received from the beginning. Paul says, let them be cursed if someone comes preaching a different gospel than we did. Friends, but this is so deceptive. And John says, I'm so glad to see people ignoring that and living and walking in the truth. Verse 8, John goes on. He says, watch out. He says, be so careful. Be constantly vigilant. Don't stop watching out. Watch out that you do not lose what we have worked so hard to achieve. Be diligent so that you will receive your full reward. Now, friends, I just have to be completely honest with you here this morning. I'm not entirely sure exactly what John means here. There's a couple different possibilities of what he could be talking about in verse 8. On the one hand, he could be talking about those deceivers, those antichrists who have came and they're preaching a different gospel, one that does not focus on Jesus but focuses on knowledge. And he's saying these guys, they might appear like they are following the truth, but they're not because they don't believe in Jesus. He referred to that back in 1 John. It's evidence because they walked away. They're teaching a new gospel. John could be talking about them here in verse 8. Or he could be talking about the work that John and the various other disciples have done in planting and nurturing and helping these churches. And now these deceivers have come in and they're threatening to destroy everything that they've worked so hard to achieve. But either way, it's safe to say that pursuing these false teachings, it results in disastrous consequences. So John says, be vigilant. Don't get sucked in. Stay true to what you've heard from the beginning. And friends, let me just say this. This is such good news or such good advice, I should say, for us today. Man, watch out. You can go online right now and you could probably find anything that you want to believe in. You could probably find multiple people that will give you evidence for why you should believe this. And some of it, man, it's convincing. Some of it's going to pull on your heartstrings. It's deceptive. John's telling us this. John says, watch out. Friends, this is why we must study the word of God. Study the truth so that we're not led astray when something shiny and flashy and cunning comes our way. Watch out. Be in the word of God. Verse 9, John continues, anyone who wanders away from this teaching has no relationship with God. But anyone who remains in the teaching of Christ has a relationship with both the Father and the Son. And so basically John's saying, what Jesus preached from the beginning, what we have heard from the beginning, what we preached from the beginning, that's what you remain in. No improvements need to be made on that. This came straight from the mouth of Jesus. I was there, I heard it, I'm passing it along to you. Remain in those teachings. And those teachings will result in a relationship with God. You see, we're in a relationship with the Father. That's what the Christian walk is. It's a relationship. It's living out what we believe. And I hear people say this all the time. They come up to me and they say, man, Ted, I just wish that God would tell me what to do. And then I would go and do it. I just don't know. I I, want to know. I want to know what to do so I can go and do it. And friends, man, I hear you on that. I have said that so many times that year back in Virginia. I can't even tell you how many times I said that. God, just tell me, just tell me. I'll go and do it. But friends, something that I have come to understand uh, is that a relationship requires walking in constant faith with the Lord. He, He doesn't often just tell us what to do and then have us go do it, at least not to the end of the journey. I've heard it illustrated this way. 
And that the relationship with the Lord is, a, is the difference between going to your friend and having him give you the final destination. And then you get in your car and you plug that destination in your GPS and you drive to that final destination. It's the difference between that and your friend saying to you, I'm going to get in the car with you. And I will lead you each turn of the way until we get to our final destination. Because that is relationship. That's the way the Lord works. He reveals steps in faith, not the entire journey. He wants us to do this life with him. John continues in verse 10. He says, if anyone comes to your meeting and does not teach the truth about Christ, don't invite that person into your home. Don't give any kind of encouragement. And this was in a culture where it was very common to invite these, these traveling preachers into their home. They didn't have a house where they were staying, and so they depended on the generosity of the people they were going to preach to to bring them in and to feed them and to house them. And John's saying, listen, if they're coming and they're not teaching the truth about Christ, don't do that. Because in doing that, you will enable them to continue to spread these lies. He says, don't invite them in. Don't give them food. Don't give them financial assistance because they're not teaching the truth. John's saying just don't help them spread these falsities. And then John finishes like this. In verse 12, he says, I have so much more to say to you on this. But I don't want to do it with paper and ink. I hope to visit soon and to talk with you face to face. And then our joy will be complete. Greetings from the children of your sister, chosen by God. And friends, these last two verses, they mean exactly as they sound, except the understanding that the children of your sister mean the members of your sister church. They are giving you their greetings and they are reminding you, you're not alone. You are in this with us. Stand strong in the faith. And friends, that's Second John. That's what he has to say, and that's where we're going to wrap up today. But here's what I want you to walk out with. Here's the challenge that I want you to put into practice this week. Ask yourself this question, how can I live my faith out? Listen, I'm not saying that we need to jump from one to a hundred on this. Take baby steps. It's kind of like a few years ago. I had played sports in college, but I, after I got done with college, I kind of took a break. And one day I was like, man, I really need to start getting back into shape. So I went out one day and I tried doing what I had been doing in college. And you know exactly how that ended because I immediately stopped the next day because I couldn't move. And I was so sore. I, I thought that was a good idea. wasn't a good idea. No, friends, slow and steady progress. Doing something once isn't life change. You need repetition. This needs to become habitual. It's similar to our walk with the Lord. Listen, here's a couple examples. Maybe this will help kind of uh, launch something in you. Maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, man, I would really, really love to show more compassion to others. Great. Pick one person. Just one. Reach out to them this week. Go and get coffee with them. Go visit them in their home. Go join the senior care team to go and show compassion to other people that need that. And then when you're done, set up another time to go back. It's not a once and done thing, but this is a consistent thing. This becomes a part of your life. You initiate it though. You initiate it. Or maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking, man, I've really been struggling with addiction, whatever that might be. It's a super broad category that just has all kinds of implications. But you say, man, I have tried stopping on my own. I don't want to be doing this. But every time I try stopping, I fall right back into it. And it's so frustrating, friends. Maybe for you, the step that you need to take this morning is you have never told anyone that you struggle with this. My encouragement, tell someone that you trust. Encourage them to encourage you, to keep you accountable, to pray with you and for you and over you, to help you. Take this first step in overcoming this addiction, whatever that may. Or maybe you have been meaning to start giving financially to the Lord. Friends, here's some advice. Don't do it begrudgingly. Give joyfully. Scripture says the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Friends, hear me. Hear my heart on this. I am not even saying you need to give here. Just give to the Lord, wherever that might be experience the joy that comes by tangibly giving him something that we could use for ourselves. When I say this, I mean it. I know of no single greater act of faith than giving 
financially. It takes a literal step of faith to be able to do that. And if you're sitting here and you're thinking, that's what I would like to do, but how in the world can I do it? Friends, if that's where you're at, start with $5 a month. Praise God. If that's what you're able to do, then praise God. Start there. Friends, whatever this might look like, and it may, maybe it's something completely different from what I mentioned, but whatever this looks like, my encouragement, my prayer as your pastor is that we would all live our faith out. How can you take steps more and more this week and in the weeks to come? Please pray with me. Father, we are thankful for your word. We are thankful for the encouragement it provides. Father, we are thankful for the challenges that it gives. Challenges are not always desirable, but that's where the growth happens, in the challenge, in the struggle. Lord, my prayer is that you would be an encouragement to each and every person, those who are here physically, those who are here watching online, Lord, that they would have the, the desire to step in more and more to what life and relationship with you looks like. Be with us, watch over us, and protect us. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you're able to stand with us, and this one may be a new one. It's called I Believe.
praise you, Christ the Son. All praise you, the Holy Spirit. Our God has So much for joining us this morning. It's always uh, such a joy to worship our Savior together. Before we head out um, this morning, I wanted to remind everyone, um, first of all, of Touch Challenge, which was to ask yourself, how can I live out my faith? And I really appreciate how Ted offered, you know, pick one area of your life because that that question alone can be really intimidating. But when we step back and look, what's one area of my life I can live out my faith better? and then focus on that one area. Um, and you know, no matter if you became a Christian this morning or you've been one for 50 years, it's a lifelong journey and there's always somewhere in our life that we can grow in our faith. So I encourage you to reflect on that. Um, also, I wanted to remind everyone of the ways to give um, and you can do that on one of the ways on the screen behind me or we have those drop boxes on the way out. Um, we thank you so much for your generosity. There are so many ministries here and your generosity helps um, keep those going and um, allows us to be the hands and feet of Christ. Um, and then finally, we have a prayer banner, and that's at the end of the stage. To your right, um, there's a prayer team here at Encounter, and they would love to pray with you and for you. So I would stop by there if you're feeling a heavy burden this morning or you just want to chat with someone. Um, we would love for you to stop by there. Thank you again for being here this morning. Um, we love to be with you, and we hope to be here again next week.
Christ the Son, all praise to the Holy Spirit. 